Okay, well, I'm coming to talk to you about this uh, encyclical. It's called Laudato Si. Does anybody know what Laudato Si means? Right? So it's uh, from a canticle by St. Francis, and Laudato Si means praise be to you, and then it says mi signore. So praise be to you, my Lord. And it's interesting because I'm giving an economic appraisal of praise be to you. Okay, and I will have a lot of praise for the encyclical, although you will see that uh, while the Pope is a prophet who sits in the chair of St. Peter, um, I won't always agree with all the specifics of the things uh, that are in La Dazza Si, uh, but I don't think any Catholic would disagree with the broadest messages of this, which are about the care for creation, the care for God's creatures, our brothers and sisters, and living a life of humility. Um, and I guess if there's a central message to what I'm gonna be saying, it's gonna be that we should not overlook the power of markets to help us solve some of the problems that the Pope talks about in this encyclical. Uh, before I get into it though, I'd just like to tell you how I became an environmentalist, a practical environmentalist. And so um, about 10 years ago, I went to a talk and it was about the rosary and the importance of praying the rosary. And I said to myself, you know, I should be praying the rosary every day. What kind of idiot doesn't pray the rosary every day? So I've got to make time in my schedule to do that. How do I do that? Okay, so I decided I'd get up a little earlier the next day, go walk around my neighborhood, and pray the rosary as I walked around the neighborhood. Okay, because I like walking, and it's a very, you know, there's not distractions when you're out on a walk like that. And so I thoroughly enjoy doing that. And I said the rosary every day. I don't think I have missed a single day since 10 years. Okay. Um, then my, my youngest child graduated from high school, and I didn't need to drive anybody to school anymore and all that. So I had a little more time, and I said, I should walk to work and back. And so I do that. I live about a 30-minute walk from my office, and I walk basically every day, unless there's a major downpour or something like that, uh, to, to work uh, and, and back. And I say my rosary on the way in, a few other prayers. I say all sorts of prayers, mainly for various priests that I've known on the way back. And then I began, as I'm walking in, like noticing like trash in my neighbor's yards. And uh, I walked by this house, I, I know that lady. She's like nine years old. Somebody's thrown. It would be very neighborly if I picked up the trash. And then I thought to myself, all these people are my neighbors. So I should pick up the, and, and I did. And I also like to go on long walks in the weekend. And so more trash. <laughs> Carry a little bag with you. Actually, sometimes five or six of them. And being the economist that I am, I keep a little spreadsheet of the numbers of how much I walk every day. <laughs> Last year, I averaged 83 minutes of walking a day, and I also keep a spreadsheet of how many bottles and cans I pick up. And last year I picked up over 3,000 bottles, and I won't tell you how many cans. So one of the key lines of Laudato Si is this. Our earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. I see lot, not that much when I go on my walk. There's this one neighborhood that's just kind of a poorer neighborhood between me and the park I like to go walk to, and especially there. And what I notice is I have changed my walks. I used to kind of walk through rich and poor neighborhoods equally, and now I kind of concentrate more on poor neighborhoods because there's a little more work to, and I can say my prayers anyway, and I will get to the park and it'll be beautiful there. Uh, but that's just my practical environmentalism that I practice. Our Earth's resources are being plundered. Those are key messages of this encyclical. So what I want to do is begin by just laying out a summary of La Data Si and then talk about what economists can contribute to it. And so here's the primary message. This is an old message, um, but with a new urgency to it. And of course, the message is materialism has run amok. We are beginning, becoming more and more materialistic, and we need to rein it in, and because we haven't reined it in. We're doing things that increasingly damage the environment. That's the key message. So his message is the environment is being mistreated. 
But as a social encyclical, it has a message that you will see in all the other social encyclicals, and that is that the poor are being mistreated as well. This encyclical is as much or more <clears throat> about people as it is about the environment, especially about God's favorite people, the poor. Uh, there's a growing poverty caused by environmental degradation. Both of these are due to the same force, says Pope Francis, and that is we are unwilling to limit ourselves and we abuse our freedom. So we've been abusing our freedom for a long time. I think that every human being since Adam and Eve, with the exception of one woman who was born a couple thousand years ago and her son, have had this problem that we abuse our freedom. Okay. So, who's to blame for these problems? First, consumers, most of them, most of us, are to blame. Right? We are gluttonous, and we live in what the Pope calls a throwaway culture. Businesses are to blame. Businesses, as the Pope sees it, are gluttonous in their quest for profits, which often involves pushing costs off on other people. And governments are to blame because they let us get away, with, they encourage us, they abet us in this very process, argues the Pope. Okay, so, he points out that we have deified the market. And when I tell my introductory econ students, you know, what is the market? There's a two-letter word that is a synonym for the market. That two-letter word is us. The market is us trading with each other. And in deifying the market, we have deified ourselves. And hasn't that been our problem since we got expelled from that garden way back? Okay? So we have distorted our, our dominion mandate, as it's called. Right? And Francis makes a very strong point of this. Our mandate on the environment is one to keep and to till. There are people who take the mandate of God giving us dominion as being dominion to do whatever the hell we want to do. Okay? But if you read in Genesis where the mandate is given, it says, let us make man in our own image and likeness and let them be masters of the various things. So we're given that dominion after being made in the image and likeness of God who would not abuse that dominion in the way that we have abused, abused that dominion. So we should think of the environment as being on loan to us for future generations. Okay. So we also believe in this modern myth of unlimited material progress and a lie that there's just an infinite supply of the Earth's goods out there. We says the Pope in Laudato Si, uh, conceive of properly incorrectly. The earth must be shared, he says, and there is always a social mortgage on property. There are strings attached. We just don't own things so that we can do whatever we want with them. We own things, we're given this ownership so that we can do things that will be beneficial to everyone. Okay? Now, modern technology, he points out, has remedied a lot of the countless evils that we've seen through the ages. Um, but it can be a problem too. It can often give uh, more knowledge and more economic resources and more power to certain people and they then end up dominating others. This modern technology, he says, ends up concentrating power. Pope also argues that jobs and work are very, very important. What is the goal of an economy uh, the goal of the economy, as the Pope largely sees it, is to actually create work, right? Work should be a setting of a rich personal growth, a creativity, a giving glory to God. Work is a vocation. Lest, uh, let us not forget that Jesus worked throughout much of his life with his hands in, in God's creation. Uh, but the Pope points out, worries, that technology can, seems to be, in many ways, causing a, a loss of jobs, a, a major worry that he has. So the central message of this encyclical is that things have gotten bad. There's a higher urgency now than there's ever been. As he states it, doomsday warnings cannot be dismissed. Okay? So how can we fix this problem? The fix, as the Pope sees it, 
must entail some kind of international coordination, actually creating global government of some sort over things like maybe the oceans or something that we have been you know, looting. Uh, polluters must pay for the damages that they create. Uh, we should maximize our energy and resource efficiency. And he endorses a precautionary pr uh, principle where we don't go forward with things unless we're pretty certain that they're going to have the benefits be higher than the cost. A, a caution uh, that, uh, okay. The Pope then points out that we often have a mindset of short-term gain in the economy. And not just in the economy, but in politics, and that mindset must be broken. So, it is time for us to slow down our economic growth, says Pope Francis. We need to stop this, I think it's an interesting way of putting it, this whirlwind of needless buying that we have been pulled into. Nobody is suggesting, says the Pope, a return to the Stone Age, but we do need to slow down and look at reality in a different way to recover the values and the great goals swept away by our unrestrained illusions of grandeur. It's time for us to be more sober. And this is a sobering read, if you've read the encyclical. We need to embrace a countercultural, liberating, healthy humility and gratitude. So the bottom line is that we need better policies, but even more deeply, Pope Francis is arguing, we need to reform ourselves. The roots of the problem are ethical and spiritual. So, what can economists offer? So probably the most common definition of economics, if you look back on the glossary of your econ textbook, you'll see a definition like this, that economics is a study of the use of scarce resources to satisfy human wants. There we go, the scarce resources that the Pope's talking about. Okay. And I think we're in a good position to be able to add some things that will help solve the kinds of problems that the Pope's talking about. So economists generally view people as being rational, and that's quite in fitting with church teaching. We are made in the image and likeness of God. We are made to be rational. What do rational people do? Rational people, when they're making decisions, just don't you know, throw a dart. Uh, they just don't act randomly or act on their uh, instincts or whatever whim passes through their mind. No, they don't do that at all. What rational people do is they think about things carefully and critically. They weigh the cost of something against the benefits. And only if they think those benefits, if it looks like those benefits are going to be higher than the cost, do they do it. If they cost all the costs, they're going to be greater than the benefits, they won't do it. That's what rational people would do. So what rational maximizers, as economists call them, do is every decision they make is, what, you know, should I do this? Should I not? Should I do a little bit more of it? And we do these kinds of decisions, I think, on a moment by moment basis. Should I eat a little bit more at breakfast? Should I, you know, should I go back for another? Uh, should I eat a little bit less? Should I drink a little bit more? Should I consume a little bit more? Should I exercise more? 84 minutes a day of walking. I don't know. Should I do more? Should I do less? Should I brush my teeth a little bit more? Should I pray more? Should I? There's an optimal amount of everything in this point of view for rational people. An optimal amount of everything. Okay. Now, economists have been looking at this since the beginning of economics. Uh, there's Adam Smith there. And he argued very persuasively, all the way back in 1776 in the Wealth of Nations, that if we know our own interests, and if there aren't these kind of spillovers on other people, then our self-interested interactions with each other will actually achieve this optimal allocation. It'll be as if, he said, we're led by some kind of invisible hand, and that brings us just to the right amount. Some would call that divine providence. Okay. But what about cases where there are negative spillovers? Okay. And there are, clearly, in lots of cases. So in cases like that, economists would say, those who are causing the pollution are going to have to pay for it. They're going to have to bear the cost for us to achieve both this efficiency and fairness. So if there are these spillovers, how do we solve the problems? How do we get back to that optimum that when there's not these spillovers, the invisible hand leads us to? Okay. And so there's kind of two key ways that economists point out. 
One is to create property rights. Why was somebody abusing a, res a resource? Probably because somebody didn't own it. And it's fair game for everybody. Okay? And so if the property rights are created, then you've got to negotiate with people to pay if you end up damaging their property. Okay? And sometimes they'll say, okay, you can do it as long as you pay me enough compensation to make it worth my while. Another way to solve these problems are taxes, what economists call Pigouvian taxes. Okay? It's basically making the polluter pay. Now I see a bunch of pollution coming out in my picture. I'm, we're generating some pollution right now because there's electric light coming in here and we've got the air conditioning on and right, electricity is being used in that process. So who's the polluter? Are we the polluter? Is the meritage the polluter? Is it the electric company? Is it the fuel supplier? Uh, the answer is all of us are the polluters. And so if you in fact put a tax in place, it will be borne by all of us. And the incidence of that tax isn't just who writes the check out to the government. No, that would be a little silly. I've never once written a check out to the government for my gasoline tax, and yet I know I bear most of that tax. Who bears the tax? And it turns out, <coughs> economic analysis shows, the bearer of the tax will be the ones that are most wedded to continuing to do the activity. In this case, most wedded to doing the pollution. So in our introductory class, we put up a simple <laughs> supply and demand graph. Couldn't avoid one. Uh, so there's supply and demand bringing us to our, our regular equilibrium. But if we put a tax in place, what's it going to do? It's going to push the price up, and people will do less of this activity. That's the idea. Okay? Notice in our picture, there's a burden on the consumers and a burden on the producers. The tax will be shared by the buyers and sellers. And how much each one of them bears of that depends on how steep the supply and demand curves are, what economists would call elasticities of supply and demand. So the tax will make the polluters pay, but don't think that the polluter is just the coal company or the power company. It's us as well, and we will end up bearing that. Because one of the laws of economics is that you know, cons if consumers don't pay enough to cover the producer's cost, they won't produce it. And if we then say, you've got to pay these additional spillover costs too, uh, well then we're going to have to bear some or all of those costs, and they will bear some of those costs as well. But a tax is only going to solve this problem if the tax is at the right level. If the tax is too big, you could end up stamping out an activity that was maybe a better way of doing it than the uh, activities they're going to do now that the tax is in place. Tax could be too small. You've got to get that tax just right. And the tax is not going to make all the pollution go away. Okay? There's an optimal amount of pollution. Maybe only an economist could say that. And you know this is true. Because in traveling here, did you create any pollution? You ended up doing it, right? But it was a worthwhile cause because coming here is going to change your life. Not this talk, I'm sure. But other talks are going to change your life. And so it'll be worth it. And so it's OK to pollute some, okay? because if we tried to wipe out all pollution, no, that, that, that just would not work. So there's even an optimal amount of pollution. OK. Now, uh, what I said is that Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, concept, which has been shown much more rigorously and mathematically by economists since then, basically argues that we're going to get to that sweet spot. We're going to get to that optimal point if there's not these negative spillovers, but also if we know our own self-interest. If we don't, we're in trouble. And in fact, that's one of the messages of this encyclical. There are some cases where we don't know our own self-interest. Economists don't have a lot to say about cases where people don't know their own self-interest. But they do often point out that they, those individuals, are in a better position to know their own self-interest than some outsider is, especially some bureaucrat in a nameless, faceless office someplace. OK? So one of the solutions I talked about before the taxes, solutions to pollution, was right, property rights. Let's think about this. Let's think about property rights solving what economists call the tragedy of the commons. So quoting the encyclical again, the Earth's resources are being plundered because of short-sighted approaches to the economy and commerce and production. So are these resources being plundered due to short-sightedness? Well, 
maybe if we define short-sightedness to be due to a lack of, of property rights, okay? Because that's usually what ends up causing the mess. So this is known as the tragedy of the commons. I'm sure you've heard of this before. That tragedy says that things that are collectively owned or are unowned, like the atmosphere, like all the you know, fish swimming out in the middle of the ocean, they end up being subject to overuse, to under maintenance, and to outright abuse because these goods are non-excludable. People can get at them even if they don't own them because nobody owns them or you know, they're somehow collectively owned. And I don't have to pay to use them. And because of that, I end up overusing them. So a classic case of the tragedy of the commons would be all those fish swimming around out in the ocean. Think about all the, the fish swimming out in the ocean. And I run one of these big right, trawling vessels. And I, you know, I go, there's a lot of fish here. But if I waited till next year, these fish, the school of fish would have a chance to grow even bigger. I should just wait till next year to fish it. Oh, oh, but uh, silly me. If I don't catch it now, probably somebody else is going to catch it before I get to catch it. And so it's in my own self-interest to catch it now. There's the problem. There's the tragedy of the commons. We overcatch our fish. See our graph here on the catch of Northwest Atlantic cod. This begins around, what, 1950? And you can see the thing get a little higher. Then they invented this better technology to go out and get these. Boy, did the catch go up. But they overfished far, far too much. And it came crashing down, a little rebound, almost wiped these things out altogether. What was the problem? Nobody owned the fish. The tragedy of the commons was this problem. Okay? So there's the problem. I don't own it. Nobody owns it. I better get it before everybody else gets it. And you can see how that would break down. Now, people have been running into this problem throughout all history. What do they do when they run into this problem? They don't ignore it. They create property rights. As population densities on land started getting higher and higher, people started creating property rights on land. Okay? And now we're having problems on the seas. We have created some property rights within territorial waters of countries on the seas as well. We don't ignore this. We solve the problem by creating property rights. Okay. So it would be good if we could solve this one. We need to create some property rights. Okay, so the Pope says, Creation is harmed where everything is simply our property and we use it for ourselves alone. Okay? But it's important to point out, as economists do, that property isn't necessarily the problem. In many cases, it's the solution to the problem. Here is a picture from the sky along the border of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And you can see this from above the problem. It's all lush and green on one side and on the other side. Things have been cut down pretty bad and they're subject to massive erosion, etc. What's the difference between the Dominican Republic and Haiti? The big difference is that property rights are much more secure in the Dominican Republic than they are in Haiti. Okay? And so in Haiti, what people do is uh, they you know, bribe somebody and they go out and they just cut everything down that they want to, or they don't bribe any, they just go and cut it down and there's nobody to stop them. It's private, secure property in Dominican Republic. You come in with your logging trucks to do that? No, you can't do it. The law and the owners will turn you away from doing that. Property rights as the solution, not as the problem. The encyclical says if we make something our own, it is only to administer it for the good of us all. And this is certainly true within your family. You use your resources in your family for the good of, of all the family. But among the whole family of man, do we actually live on this? Do we act that way? And we haven't since we got expelled from that garden way back. And so sad experience has taught us this, that if you don't, we don't have individual ownership of property, what happens when we collectivize things? We saw this in Russia, we saw this in China, etc. So let's say 100 families own this, and you get one one-hundredth of the, the output. Are you going to work as hard as you would if you were the one who got all the excess? Are you going to maintain the property as well? Do those long-term kinds of investments to make sure there's not erosion, right? To keep fertilizing the soil, do those kinds of things. 
Your payoff is such a small slice of this that sad reality shows that you don't do that. That's the lesson of communism and led to mass starvation when they started to collectivize. What's the lesson uh, of, of capitalism? And that is when we administer our property for ourselves, for the good of ourselves, it often leads, not always, but often leads to the good of all because we don't waste those resources. They're ours to have into the future. We constantly look for ways to improve productivity. We make investments now that can pay off over years to come. We can even use this property as collateral since we own it and then get a loan and you know, raise some money to help improve it in even bigger ways. Okay? So the lesson of ca capitalism is that, th ironically, this uh, looking out for our own self-interest has led to soaring incomes and a decline in absolute poverty. And it's so clear you can see it from outer space. So here's a nighttime map of the Korean Peninsula. And I mean, if you didn't know better, you'd think South Korea was a, an island. But no, it's actually attached. And the dark half is the North Korea, which went the way of communism and collective ownership. And the southern half is South Korea, which started out at the time of the Korean War with the standard of living, the same as in North Korea. North Korea was actually a little more industrialized. South Korea is now a first world country, which has eliminated absolute poverty. And North Korea is one of the poorest countries in the world. There's also a former communist country that you can see in the map. That's China, communist in name only, because they adopted capitalism. And you can see lights up there in, in China as well. So it is so obvious you can see this from outer space. Uh, quoting from the Laudato Si, the environment cannot be adequately safeguarded or promoted by market forces. And so I think the message I'm trying to bring together from these is that we shouldn't underestimate the power of the market, which is us voluntarily trading with each other. If we want to safeguard the, uh, the environment, we can get the market to do this if we arrange things right, with the right property rights, with the right incentives. La Data C points out a growing tendency, despite its scarcity, to privatize things that were formerly not, like even water. Uh, he's talking here in like poor developing countries. Turning it into a commodity. But the economist in me would say that, you know, if you really want the poor to have safe and affordable water, you need to set up a system where somebody can profit by delivering this. Otherwise, if nobody owns it, it ends up getting wasted. Now, let me turn to public choice economics. Public choice economics is the branch of economics that looks at the choices that we make collectively, often through the government. And I think that Pope Francis is a, is a keen public choice economist because he has a very good sense uh, that you just shouldn't assume that the government's going to be benign. It's riddled, can be riddled with corruption, and him being from Argentina, I think he, he grew up seeing this. Uh, however, he tends to side with government over markets in many cases. Uh, here's a quote from Laudato Si. Politicians will inevitably clash with the mindset of short-term gains which dominates present-day economics and politics. I think this misses the likelihood that short-termism is even worse in politics than it would be in, in economics, okay? because there's a tragedy of the commons at work. Economists call this the tragedy of the fiscal commons. The fiscal commons. All those tax dollars. Politicians realize, I'm not going to be here forever. What good is it for me to save up some money running budget surpluses for future politicians to spend and to get the credit for? No, 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 no. I want to spend that money now, have a nice signing ceremony, and I want me to get the credit and look like I'm being generous by taxing, <laughs> by spending your money even before I tax it, by borrowing it. This is like catching the little uh, tax dollar fish swimming around in the ocean, catching them before they're even spawned, okay? That fiscal tra tragedy of the commons has led to massive debt problems in our country and countries all over the world. I see it as worse than <laughs> uh, maybe the economic tragedies of the commons. The Pope points out that resources tend to get into the hands of those who are the most powerful. Uh, the winner takes all. And I think that this model of resources uh, being allocated by bribing and grabbing and plundering fits some countries very, very well. Especially when government claims 
all of the below ground resources and often some of the above ground resources. So you're in a country where if there's oil underground or something like that, the government owns it. What's going to end up happening? This would be a country maybe like Nigeria. Some multinational comes in, bribes the government, makes a sweetheart deal between the two of them, plunders those resources, befouls the, the entire environment, spills, dirty, whatever, doing this. But what happens if there's private property to those? And you own what's under your land. The oil company has to come in, bribe you. That is, pay you for these resources. And you're not going to pay it unless they make a good price. You're not going to let them do it unless they promise to do it pretty cleanly. Uh, like the oil wells you would have in suburban Dallas-Fort Worth area. Right? You've got to pay people for it, and they're going to do it pretty darn cleanly. So economists see lots of economic growth around the world and poverty, we, and poverty declining. Economists expect the unprecedented reductions in global poverty to continue. We think that because market forces have already reduced poverty, and countries have learned those lessons, they'll keep them in places. And these are dramatic numbers I have up here. You can see a, an abysmally low standard of poverty that we're measuring here. This is the, Wor the World Bank's favorite measure. It's people living on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day in year 2005 dollars. So maybe a buck 50 a day in today's dollars. And in Africa, you can see at the beginning here in 1990, uh, over half of the people living on less than $1.50 today. And, other, and you can just see they're coming down in place after place around the world, especially in East Asia, but Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South Asia, Latin America, coming down everywhere as these places have turned to using the market to solve their problems. My ride from the airport yesterday, the driver was from Ethiopia, and he was just telling me, how the Ethiopian economy is booming. Ethiopia, their economy is booming. And just poverty is starting to melt away in places like that as well. Okay. So, as economists read the evidence, it doesn't really take a lot of land and resources to generate a lot of wealth. Look at rich places around the world like Singapore. They got a lot of land and resources? No. Or think about places uh, that just are dry and without a lot of natural resources, like in the Middle East. I have figures here on incomes per person in Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, and Jordan. Israel is a pretty rich country. Those others, not nearly so rich. They've got the same amount of resources, but Israel has put in place secure property rights, right? They put in place the things that are going to give you uh, economic growth, better institutions, cultural attitudes that favor economic growth, importing of technology, the development of human capital. Okay, so let me skip over that one because I don't have quite enough time. So let's think about doomsday and then think about ourselves. Okay? Doomsday predictions can no longer be met with irony or disdain. Pace of consumption, waste, and environmental change can only precipitate catastrophes. La data C. Economists actually don't see doomsday in our future. And I know this because I surveyed them. I just asked them, you know, what do you think is going to happen in the next uh, 50 or 60 years? And economists think that the economic growth is going to continue in the United States, and they think it's going to continue around the world. They see the poorer countries of the world rising in the future to what are the development, you know, developing country standards today. Economists also don't think that the impact of greenhouse gases is going to harm economic growth that much. Just a couple percentage points by the end of the century in an economy that's you know, tripling and quadrupling over the time. Economists' biggest worries about what can harm our, our standard of living is things like bad regulations, too much debt, fleecing the young and the next generation. And so back to the quote that the Earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. In fact, in many ways, uh, the environment has been getting cleaner. I've got numbers here. The first one is for the Bay Area. It's the number of smoggy days falling down. Then we've got the Los Angeles area, and that's peak ozone levels. And then Mexico City, uh, you know, their 
suspended particulate matter, or, or, you know, and in fact, that environment's getting cleaner. Now, why does the Pope say that the Earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth? There are places where this is definitely true, but economists point out there's an optimal amount of everything, and there's an optimal amount of hyperbole as well. Okay? Sometimes you need to use hyperbole to grab people by the collar and get their attention. But even if we weren't facing a doomsday, there are very good reasons for us to reject that whirlwind of needless buying. Rejecting this whirlwind has merits for people like us who already have enough or probably too much. And we know that money only buys happiness up to a certain point. Um, and we're up to the point where more money doesn't really buy us much happiness. So, you don't need to be facing doomsday to reject this whirlwind. Okay? So, what would happen if we, rich people that we are, whoops, went too far, what would happen if we took his advice and rejected this whirlwind, this living to consume? What would happen? If you just did it on your own and adopted a simpler lifestyle, you might lose status in other people's lives. They're like, Seems like a good guy, but look at that car he's driving. You know, I always thought kind of highly of that guy until I went to his house. It's such a modest place, you know. You might lose status. And you know what? Good. Because status is one thing that's not going to get you into heaven. Okay? But what would happen if we all took this advice and just reduced our consumption? This could cause a little bit of a disruption to the economy, right? If we all started to cut back, there could be a bumpy ride. The Keynesians especially would point out a bumpy ride. But in the long run, we'd get back to an equilibrium pretty close to full employment, where people who were looking for jobs had jobs. Okay? And the long-term record shows that the technology is destroying some jobs but creating other new jobs. It could be a pretty bumpy ride if we just all cut back. But that's not what Pope Francis is suggesting, that we merely all just cut back. In fact, he's suggesting the next story, this next step down. How about if we just work hard like we do now, because work is our vocation and work is a good thing. Instead of using all the extra money we have to consume more and more, we could use these same resources to help those people who currently don't have nearly enough to consume. That would be a much better model. And it wouldn't lead to these bumpy economic trends transitions that we talked about. Okay. Hmm. That's what he has in mind. Doing something that's really good for our own souls, not overconsuming, not getting locked into this materialism. And so he asks us, um, we'd actually keep using a lot of resources if we kept producing as much, because we're very productive people. Uh, but he asks us, uh, I, I like this sign, it says, have you signed the Laudato Si pledge? You can go online to catholicclimatemovement.global slash live Laudato Si, or just Google live Laudato Si, and it will take you to this. And there's a little pledge you can take. And there's people in the, on the website holding up signs of what they did, what they pledged. Could we do this? We could do it without breaking a sweat. But we should do it breaking a sweat. We should do it. So there's a little bit of pain involved because that pain will be good for us in the long term, in the, the eternal term, right? And so uh, I think we've got time for just a, a, a little bit of a discussion. Um, what could we be doing so that we could get ourselves out of this whirlwind of consumption? Driving your car a little more miles before you buy the new one, right? not moving into a bigger house, um, hanging your clothes out on the line instead of using the dryer. I mean, big things and little things. There's so many things that we could be doing. So thank you. So that wraps it up. Thank you guys for being here.